In our last video, we took you through one of our new favorite destinations, Colorado, where we got to see some sights, pull on some rocks, and also zip line off of some too, all within a few compact days. But we had to continue on our way, so we left off as we cruised through the mountains in the middle of the night, right past Aspen. I'm talking about a little place called Aspen. I don't know, Lloyd, the French are assholes. We were blasting it on a mission to cross the border of yet another state we hadn't ventured into yet, and that was Utah, specifically en route to Moab. Here, the highway speeds were around 80 miles per hour, which in Canadian translates to about 129 kilometers, to be exact. You should know that we have some heavy feet and the math is imperfect, so we usually add a couple kilometers on top of that just to be safe. If you've been following this trip from the beginning, you know what this car looked like all packed up with all of its stuff. Now imagine how this baby just purred at those speeds down the highway. It didn't. It was eerie driving in the desert in the middle of the night. These monolithic structures just stood on the horizon, like giants blocking out portions of the sky. We knew we were in a landscape we hadn't seen before, but it was still hidden by the veil of the night. So we made it to our campsite to rest, anxious to reveal the landscape in the morning sunrise. We rolled out of our luxury car camper with the cool hues of Colorado still in our minds and were pleasantly surprised by the contrasting bright reds of Moab. It was like stepping out of a spaceship onto an alien planet. That is literally like the best way I could describe it. So this is the campground where we stayed while in Moab. And you can see our car camping setup here. You might have already seen this clip in our Matrix build video, which you can also check out if you haven't. A cool thing about this place was that since we were visiting in the off season, we just had to fill out a form and put a minimal fee in an envelope and drop it into a box and that was it. So even though we arrived at some point in the early morning in the pitch black, we had no issue getting a spot and getting right to bed. Hopefully we didn't annoy any other campers or residents, and if we did, we apologize. That morning we had breakfast, which was our first fully cooked meal with our camping supplies, which was super nice to finally just sit in our own space and enjoy a coffee that wasn't from a fast food drive through But we tried not to waste too much time because we could tell that the landscape outside the campgrounds had a lot to offer us. So we packed up into our multi-whatever vehicle and got back on the road to take in the scenery and hopefully make it to some boulders to fall off of. Venturing out, we quickly grab some directions and coordinates to the Big Bend bouldering area. And good thing we did because the majority of the drive we had zero reception. The drive was super visually stunning and considering that this was our first day in the landscape, it was exactly what we needed to introduce us to the natural beauty of this place. Driving through these canyons revealed breathtaking sights around each bend. And the bend where the boulders were on display was no different. Honestly, this bouldering area was super cool. We are used to having to hike into everything we climb, even to this day. But this area was literally right off the road, and the boulders were right off the parking area. Most of the boulders are immediately visible, something that makes it visually really appealing, and meant that finding boulders also was super convenient. Something not common in most areas that we've been to. We didn't have a guidebook, so we kind of just walked around looking for features and chalk and just climbed things that looked possible. So like we have said in other videos, we might not have sent the intended sequence or lines, but we will try to name the boulders and problems we were on, or partially on. <laughs> With that said, any names of boulders or problems that we drop here are from me poking around on the internet years later trying to figure out what we actually hopped on. So excuse me if I make any mistakes. I apologize. This first boulder that we hopped on was the flat top boulder. Specifically on this problem, 
which upon further research is called Leftover Lover, conveniently on the left side of the boulder. I hopped right on and stretching for the edge, I topped right out. Laura, on the other hand, has a negative ape index and without fully committing and cutting everything and tossing to the top, she wasn't able to reach it. Unfair, I would say, somebody should complain to the head root setter. Pronto. After I climbed the problem, I realized that there was probably a sit start. Again, as novices without a guidebook, I wasn't sure where it actually started, so I repeated it just to be safe. And then it was this boulder's turn. I'm not entirely sure if it even had a name, but it was definitely the warmest of the warm-ups. Maybe if it doesn't have a name, that could be the stand-in name because it was super easy and it probably should have been the boulder that we warmed up on before the last one. Next, we found this really cool boulder, which we now know to be the mushroom boulder. Its shape was really cool and unlike any other boulder we had seen anywhere. I assume its aesthetic was created through washout as the shape seems very organic, like it was carved by moving water, which I guess kind of makes sense because I know the sandstone that surrounds Moab is actually quite fragile. That is also a perfect segue for me to note to any other novice climbers, like we were in this video and arguably still are, that you shouldn't climb these features when wet. You will ruin them for everyone else, inclusive of your future self. As you can see in this footage, the rock was bone dry, and I assume what many would consider to be perfect conditions to send your V0 projects on. On this boulder, we kind of just freestyled it, starting and topping out when and wherever we wanted. Or in my case, less topping out and more of a beached whale kind of thing, and Laura not even bothering to top out at all. I do have to say that Laura fared pretty well on this boulder, considering that it was completely overhanging and this was before she could even do a single pull-up. This boulder is named Black Box. I assume because it was covered in black markings and was essentially shaped like a giant box. There is definitely a theme with visual naming at this place. And yet again, we can kind of see the lack of guidebook come into play here, as I think I kind of traversed through a few different problems, and the grade of this line probably lands in the middle of all three problems that I used holds from. I don't want to piss anyone off, so let's just play it safe and say that it was probably, I don't know, uh, a V16 and also a first ascent. Yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. Lastly, we hopped on this problem on the Waco Traverse Boulder. This problem is called Waco Cranks. There was this cute kid that had to be like, I don't know, three years old, climbing with his dad. He was super cute. And I'm just going to shut up for a second and close caption this because it is pretty hilarious. Where do you live? Canada. You were just telling us, like your friend Max. Well... Are you Max's grandma and grandpa's? Yeah. No, <laughs> but I'm pro I probably know them. I mean, we are in our 30s, but hardly grandparents. Although some days we feel kind of like it. I also repeated the problem with a slightly different beta that I thought of after I climbed down the first time. And just like that, we were done at Big Bend. So we rushed towards the campsite in a hurry, hoping that we could squeeze in the last little bit of the day to visit Arches National Park, which we did. We definitely didn't give Arches enough time and it felt super rushed, trying to get in and out before nightfall. So we kind of just did the park tour in fast forward. But we still managed to stop along the way and get some pretty nice photos, including this one of the clock tower.
Our timing kind of actually worked out though because we got to see arches in Golden Hour and there aren't many more spectacular sights than that. Unfortunately, on this road trip, we didn't have a decent video camera, so most of what you see here is just GoPro footage or cell phone footage. So the images you're seeing really don't do it justice at all. The sights are definitely way more spectacular in real life, and they're worth a visit if you haven't been there. There's my husband. Hi. We started to drive out of the park before we got lost in the dark, and we went back to our campsite again, cooked one final meal, and then went to sleep to continue on our journey the next day. The next morning we were in such a rush to get going that we didn't really get any footage. So you are spared from another driving time lapse, but just this one time. But we ended up driving towards Salt Lake City, and the first thing we did was stop off at Momentum Lehigh. This gym was definitely super clean and modern. We really liked the layout and the amenities here. This is the first time that we had climbed in an indoor top out boulder that was organic. Clearly I wasn't used to the slopey top out, hence the graceful use of knees here, which should look pretty familiar from our outdoor bouldering footage anyways. There were lots of fun things to climb, and while the grades may have seemed a little bit stiffer here, they were still comparable to what we were used to. The elevation here also put us around 1400 meters above sea level, so we were also definitely weakened in the elevation of the city and it was hard to tell how weak or how strong we actually were. And here we see Laura working on a slab problem back when she used to like slab. Oh, how times have changed. I found this climb late in the night. It was a super fun boulder problem, but it was very muscly with these kind of pinchy, slopey holds. I was so close to getting it, but like our last experience in the gym in Chicago, we were tired and probably not in the best shape to try hard. And with that, we were on our way to Salt Lake, where we stayed at the classiest of car camping locations, your neighborhood Walmart. Like most of our travels, we arrived at our destination under the cover of night and had no clue of our surroundings. We rolled out of our car to a surprisingly beautiful mountain scene in a Walmart parking lot. I'm sure I blended right in with my pajamas and camera in hand taking photos next to the car to return. There was also an IHOP where we grabbed some convenient breakfast. We decided that the day was going to be a more relaxing one, so we decided to look for a hot spring. Now, we would have loved to find a natural hot spring somewhere, but given our lack of geographical knowledge and time, we found one with artificial pools, but it was fed by a real hot spring. What really made this place cool was the mountains that surrounded it that also punctuated the drive there. Just look at this view as we drove towards the springs. Anyhow, it's a bit weird filming around people in their bathing suits, so there isn't much evidence of us actually there, but it was definitely relaxing. Oh, and remember when I just said that we were going to have a relaxing day? Yeah, that was a lie. We found out that there was this really cool gym called The Front, and we couldn't resist checking it out. 
and undoing all of that relaxation. Now, I know some people are thinking you're in Utah and you decide to go to a climbing gym rather than outside. Again, we were pretty green to climbing outdoors and this was at night and the gym was definitely worth the visit. I believe the same wall manufacturer was involved in this gym as the one in Chicago, which I believe was Vertical Solutions. And similarly, it had these incredible multi-story rope roots, uh, curved walls, and just some super modern bouldering walls. But of course, we opted for the more dated and well-loved bouldering area in the back. You pumped? Now, I don't think we need commentary through these boulder problems, so I'll just cut them to music. You got it! Yeah, ah! Oh. Yeah, you got it! Nice, Laura, come on. Nice, come on. Woo! <laughs> Beautiful. Come on. Good job. Yeah, and of course, partway through climbing, Laura wandered off and found herself in this strange room with these weights in it, and she was doing whatever this stuff is. After climbing, we ended up setting up camp at this KOA campsite, which we had a bunch of headaches with because the campsites are only seasonal, and since we were out of season, we weren't allowed to use those sites. Only the RV sites were open, but they also didn't like that we had parked and paid to stay at an RV site because for some reason, this beast of a vehicle wasn't considered an RV. I, I don't know why. But after some convincing, they finally let us stay in our spot. Anyway, it was a huge headache. I guess that takes us to our final day in Utah. And there was one more thing we really wanted to do before we left, and that was to visit the Bonneville Salt Flats. Now, if you're a car person, you've probably heard of the Salt Flats, and you've probably seen pictures and videos from the Salt Flats. If you're not a car person, but you've seen a car commercial, you have probably seen a car driving in this place. It is super spectacular, and it is really hard to describe, and again, the footage does not do it justice. And on paper, I mean, it seems pretty straightforward. It is a completely flat, kind of barren salt land that extends on kind of forever. But when you're there, you get this 360 view of mountainscapes all around you, and it kind of seems to stretch just for infinity. In fact, when we started to walk away from our car into the environment, as we got further and further away, we actually realized how vast the space was and that you could probably lose track and lose orientation of what exact direction you headed out in. And you could walk back towards where the road was, but probably end up 
like miles away from where you actually parked. So we didn't end up venturing too far. We kind of stayed within the view of our car and, and just hung out and took some photos here. asks, no, we didn't drive our car on here. We weren't sure if you're allowed to, and I'm not completely sure you actually are allowed to, although I did see a couple cars hop the curb and go for a rip. But I mean, I don't think our car was in the greatest condition to drive super fast through the salt flats. And while the views were really beautiful, it was kind of a sad moment as we drove away, realizing that this was kind of our last real sight of Utah. Utah wasn't really a stop that we actually planned to stay there that long, but when we got there, we just realized there was so much there for us, and we wish we were able to stay there longer. And that's probably why it's on our list whenever we can eventually travel again to head back to. And with that, we were on our way back to our campsite for one last sleep. Because in the morning we were about to travel the rest of our way through Washington State and to Vancouver Island, which was our next stop. So yeah, if you like this video, please click the like button. And if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. As I've said before, it means a lot to us and it would actually help out the channel. Thanks again for watching and hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Take it easy. Peace out.